Imagine you're a law-abiding citizen, and your cousin commits a crime. <laughs> but the sheriff locks you up, too, because you bear a family resemblance. Oh, well. Johnny. That's what's going on in the United States with marijuana and hemp, also known as industrial hemp. They're from the same species of plant, but are different varieties. It's like poodles and wolves. Same species, different breeds. Hemp can make thousands of products and the planet healthier. The only thing it can't do is make a person high. Bummer, man. Something other industrialized countries understand. They farm it and reap the profits. But in the United States, while it's legal to import millions of dollars of hemp products, it's illegal to grow as a crop. It wasn't always this way. Believe it or not, hemp once flourished in America. When I started designing this home and started to look and to specify materials, we just went on a worldwide search for about the first three or four months to try to find materials that I felt comfortable with that met my standard. And that standard would be in reference to my child, who is a nine-year-old disabled little girl that has some fairly extreme chemical sensitivities. Russ and Karen Martin, who we designed and built the very first hemp house in the United States for, their number one thing was they wanted it to be beautiful, they wanted it to be healthy. But they had no idea that I was gonna hit them over the head with what I was getting ready to propose to them. They'd never heard of hempcrete. Once I started to tell people that I was considering using this for a building material, it really became a joke. I became the hemp guy. There were jokes from the local media. But, you know, all joking aside, all it took was five minutes of time doing a little bit of research to realize that, you know what, this plant is really amazing and it could hold so many different positive things for our life. And, uh, you know, I was willing to take that leap of faith. And it really wasn't a leap at the end of the day. It's just a plant. There are a whole host of lawful and helpful pharmaceutical products that enable people to cope with their pain. Many of those products are opium-based products. Recognizing the benefits of the products, there's no one who would suggest that we should start cultivating opium poppies here in this country. It's much like the poppy scenario, how you have the poppy plant that has high opiates and you have the poppy plant that goes on your muffins. That poppy plant still has trace amounts of opiates, but it's so low that it's not psychoactive. You're not gonna get the opiate high. Cannabis has the same structures in it, where you have marijuana that has high THC, high psychoactive, that type of medicinal attribute, and then you have hemp that's low THC, which is much like the poppy that's going on your muffin. It's still there, but it's at such a low level that it's not psychoactive in the body. The industrial hemp shiv is what this is here, and it looks like wood chips. Let's say this is the exterior of the home, and that's the interior of the home. As the air is slowly passing through, and the wall is breathing, it's holding on to toxins, pollutants, and carbon from the atmosphere. I was trying to find a solution for problems with standard insulation and drywall issues that cannot be overcome. And the hempcrete wall replaces both of them. Between the breathability and the content of the lime keeps that wall from ever having mold or mildew growth, which can never be said about the standard insulation that's used and drywall. We've got an epidemic in this country right now with the amount of mold that we've got in our homes. And industrial hemp with the hydrated lime, I now believe that it's the world's healthiest material that we can use in building. Currently, we are importing the industrial hemp from the UK. The issue with importing the industrial hemp is its cost. It's very expensive to ship it overseas until we are in a position in the US where we can effectively grow it here and cultivate it and process it, we're stuck with this solution. This is a 50 acre crop of hemp to the west of London. The variety is called Ouzo. It's a French variety which is suitable for dual cropping. That's suitable for seed and fiber. So the seed will be going to the good oil company and the fiber will be going to hemp technology. So if we cut through a stem, you can separate the fibres from the woody core. And that's why the factory is called a decortification plant, because it separates that woody core from the fibre 
that runs up the outside of the stem. And it's the fibre that goes into loft insulation, car door panels, and it's the woody core that is mixed with lime cement to make hempcrete for construction. The project that the hemp pod is a fundamental part of is a three-year project which is funded by DEFRA, the Department of Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, a UK government institution, and supported by various industrial partners because they believe in the potential for this. And here's the inside of the hemp pod. You can see we've got sensors on all four walls. The whole theory behind the construction is to allow it to breathe. So you don't want to be putting impervious materials in the wall. You don't want to put plastics or seal it up. That's one of the problems with a lot of modern houses. They try and seal them and you get this awful sort of sick building syndrome. Sick building syndrome is caused by the materials in our houses. These materials are made of all kinds of chemicals, which we breathe and touch continually, making us sick, even though we may have no idea why. When the humidity is constant, you breathe better. You don't have any illness. It is the light that asks how you can build a house in a normal way using that material. Once it's built into the building, it's fire resistant, it is a good thermal resistance, and it's good for the living environment. A better insulation in these houses. The hemp fibre insulation is made as a quilt and is very similar to glass fibre or mineral wool insulations in, in its look, but it's actually much nicer to work with because it doesn't have any hazardous components in it, so you don't need to wear gloves and goggles and mask, and you can use it in virtually all the places that you would use glass fibre or mineral wool insulation, so attics and walls. And it has very, very similar thermal insulation properties, but it has much better thermal mass to it. Plastics is a major problem, and that's why the hemp plastic sides, the hemp biocomposites, one of the most exciting things that we can possibly be looking at at the moment. Processing hemp. Hemp is grown under contract for us by local farmers. We take the crop in and split it into its constituent parts. This is how hemp fibre is used in the automotive industry. This is a car door panel for a BMW 3 Series car. The use of natural fibres in these applications reduces the car's weight by a couple of kilos. And that all helps towards reducing fuel consumption. The automotive industry and animal bedding business markets are the largest part of our business. We expect the construction industry to grow rapidly over the next few years. In fact, within four or five years, we see that overtaking to be maybe 70 to 80% of our business. People go and they buy some mass-produced T-shirt that has been dyed and has chemicals on it, and they put it on their body or on their baby, and it's going to into you. Our skin is the largest organ on our body, and there are chemicals used in clothing to process fibers and fabric, and the dyeing is very toxic. And I've had clients specifically come to me because of that. They're allergic to dyes used in regular clothing, and they need something that's either a natural dye or not dyed at all. Emporium is a South African hemp company that's been going since 1996. And it all started with something as simple as this, a little piece of cannabis canvas. And those words sound similar because they are similar. The word canvas comes from the same root as cannabis. And all canvas used to be made out of hemp. And that's where it ties in with the history on using hemp in the sails, and obviously the ropes on all the boats as well. Even in South Africa, our Afrikaans word for shirt is hemp. We learned that this was a durable fabric. It made perfect sense to make bags out of it. We started making many more products and using our clothing especially as a message taker. An eco-audit was done in Canada where they grew conventional cotton and a hectare of conventional hemp and did the comparisons. And it was about 2,000 litres per T-shirt saving of water and about a cup of pesticides and agrochemicals. Hemp provides about 250% more fibre per hectare than cotton. So every shirt is making a difference. This is hemp denim. It's hemp mixed with organic cotton. And I'm making a skirt. And this I order from Hemp Traders, and it, I do that online. This is actually an order for a girl in San Francisco. She ordered this and a blazer to go with it. So she got the whole outfit. There's so many variations on hemp fabrics these days. I mean, you can get the hemp silk, 
the hemp denim, hemp suede. There is hemp twill, hemp muslin. They're beautiful fabrics that are all very breathable, comfortable, uh, washable. You can tell the difference when you have the fabric in front of you and you feel it. It's just a, a quality thing. A lot of the, the fabric that I'm buying is actually grown in China or in Canada, but the majority is in China. And it would just be amazing if it were grown here and it would be a lot cheaper as well, because right now it's definitely one of the more expensive fabrics out there. People have used hemp seed oil since the ancient Egyptians as a nutritional supplement. When Glyn and I started growing hemp, we were drawn to the really light, nutty taste of the seed. And we learned about the hemp seed oil that had been around for a very long time. And it tasted to us very strong and not the kind of thing that you'd want to eat. It took us 10 years to develop this oil. And it's shelf stable. Used just like an olive oil, although it's much healthier, with 25 times more omega-3 and half the saturated fat. If you're going to use a fat in a product that is based on fat, which is salad dressings and mayonnaise, it, it just seems obvious to us that you would use the healthiest oil that you can. In the United States, mayonnaise is our biggest seller. Nativa is the number one purchaser of organic hemp in the world today. We're purchasing over three million pounds of organic hemp seeds that were grown in Canada. A big challenge is people don't know the benefits of hemp from a nutritional perspective, and so we have a big job ahead of us there. Dr. Oz on national TV has promoted hemp and hemp milk, and that's been helpful. I love hemp seeds. I love them for breakfast, mm -hmm. and then they have hemp milk. What makes hemp a superfood is its excellent source of protein. It's the closest balance of essential fatty acids of anything that grows in the land compared to fish. It's easy to put it on salads and smoothies. You can put it on oatmeal. You can bake bread with it. And it's got a light, nutty flavor. And it's just very simple to add to virtually any recipe that you think of. You can put it even on ice cream. Doctors recommend eating deep-sea fish, flax, and hemp internally because we're chronically deficient in our diet for omega-3. We need it for healthy brain function good skin, and topically in cosmetics, that omega-3, the skin can just incorporate it directly into the sebum. And in our soap, what we found is it really made the lather smoother and less drying. So it's been an important super fat ingredient in our soaps for over 15 years. So a lot of soap is petroleum-based. When you're using that, you're putting petroleum on your skin, and it's just not healthy. With hemp-based soap, you have no toxins. The history of hemp. Year zero, the Big Bang. The universe begins. 150 million years ago, plants debut, including him. The dinosaurs didn't notice. 800 BC, China. The first cloth fabric is made from him. 1200 BC, hemp fiber is used to construct the pyramids. 1425, knights drink hemp beer. 1492, Columbus floats to America using hemp sails and rope. Dang it! 1776, the Declaration of Independence is drafted on hemp paper. 1889, Van Gogh paints masterpieces on hemp canvas. 1942, Patriotic farmers plant hemp crop for war effort. 1970, the Controlled Substances Act is signed into law. Industrial hemp is classified as marijuana, and farming it becomes illegal. The modern interest in hemp began in the 1980s. There was a book published by a guy named Jack Herrer called The Emperor Wears No Clothes, re-educating people about hemp's long history and the many benefits of the crop. It wasn't really in the history books anymore, so you didn't learn about it in school. In 1916, USDA botanist Leister Dewey proved that hemp produces four times more paper per acre than trees. But America's hemp industry battled competition from other easier to process crops like cotton. The government's reefer madness campaign in the 30s linked to marijuana use by Mexican immigrants and jazz musicians with wild tales of crime and debauchery. The Marijuana Tax Act of 1937 contained penalties 
effectively prohibiting the devil's lettuce. It also regulated what was left of the hemp industry out of existence. Despite a 1938 Popular Mechanics article calling hemp the new billion dollar crop. Uncle Sam loved hemp again when the fiber was needed in World War II and encouraged children in 4-H clubs to plant seeds. The last commercial hemp crops grew in the late 50s. In 2010, Dewey's diary is discovered and reveals the Pentagon was built on land where he grew hemp for the U.S. government. The Hemp for Victory program in World War II demonstrates the power of what our society can do when our elected officials are on the same wavelength with industry and are working together. And our hemp supply got cut off by the Japanese. From the Philippines, we put an emergency hemp program. We had American farmers growing 25,000 acres of hemp within a year. And, and hemp infrastructure and processing all set up. And it was amazing. The goal for 1943 is 300,000 acres. And then, of course, we dismantled it and red taped it to death. Tell them they're not allowed to do that. Law enforcement's objection to cultivation of industrial hemp has nothing to do with the end products that are sold. We have no interest in interfering with those products. Those are lawful products. By all accounts, they bring certain benefits to people who use them. 15 days after 9-11, they published in the congressional record a new regulation that would equate hemp foods and our candy bars, our hemp is in the same category as heroin. And it was gonna make it illegal for us to sell. And if I continue to sell, I would face jail time of 10 to 15 years. And we thought this was outrageous. And we partnered with Dr. Bronner's and Nature's Path and the Hemp Industry Association and sued the US DEA in court and luckily we were successful and won in 2004, and now hemp foods as a precedent is legal to consume, and the court ruled the DEA should stay out of regulating foods when hemp is a legal, healthy product, and there's no connotation to drugs at all. The Canadian farmers and industry has a market lock on US, thanks to the drug warrior idiocy in the United States. It says, here, here's this huge exploding market of hemp. Here you go, Canada. And American farmers are totally cut out of it. It's all about economic development, that right now they're holding back American farmers, American manufacturers by refusing to let farmers grow hemp. It's only hurting us. The Industrial Hemp Farming Act would redefine industrial hemp as distinct from marijuana, and it would specifically define it as cannabis plants that have three-tenths of one percent of THC, THC being the active ingredient in marijuana that gets somebody high or less, and then it would allow states that want to allow their farmers to grow hemp to regulate it. And it's bipartisan support. We have both Republicans and Democrats on the bill. And it's been one of the interesting things with hemp is that it's really not a partisan issue. You know, in almost every state where we've ever passed a bill, we've always had Democrats and Republicans who have supported it. It's amazing how difficult Congress has been and how unwilling to hold hearings. The Obama administration totally unwilling to even meet with us to discuss this. Our point is, once again, we're stuck with the federal government standing in the way of states that want to move forward with this. There's been a lot of talk about sustainability, but sustaining what we are doing at the moment on the planet is probably not possible. So it's more a question of resilience building, if we're really honest. We have to prepare for the type of shocks that just might happen. The systems we have built to exist on this world at the moment are very sophisticated, but very frail because of that. And what has happened in Japan recently and what is happening in America as we speak shows how our systems are very vulnerable to nature. So we should really be thinking of working with nature and hemp provides us with the most perfect tools to do that. I think oftentimes in our world we forget how powerful and beautiful and healing the natural world can be. I feel like there's a tremendous amount that we can learn from nature and our animals and our plants and our earth and that we need to respect that. The main message I like to get across with hemp is that it's such an easy, positive way to make change on the planet. It is so easy to use hemp to decrease your footprint. The reality is that hemp is hope. It's bringing something that's done it all before back into creating a green future for the planet and helping us all be sustainable on this beautiful earth. Mm -hmm.